Welcome to the Ad Nauseam Podcast, where classical gourmands everywhere can finally get their fill. Join us for a delectable discussion of Greco-Roman civilization stretching from the Minoans and Mycenaeans through the Renaissance and right down to the present. And now, ladies and gentlemen, here are your hosts, Dr. David Noe and Dr. Jeff Winkle. Welcome, Ad Nauseam listeners, to episode 122. My name is Dr. David C. Noe. I am down here in the bunker, Vomitorium South, with my good friend and fabulous co-host, Dr. Jeffrey T. Winkle. How are you today, Jeff? I'm feeling good because we're down in the bunker yes. where it is naturally cooler. It is nice, isn't and it? And because up up top, you know, like, like 70 feet above us. It's blazing. It's blazing hot. Right. So, yeah. But don't you start with that because well, it was recently smarch. Yeah. And you were, you know, griping about that. I'm always and, griping about it. You know, I was just talking to my wife the other day. Yeah. And she says, you have such a narrow window of weather that's acceptable to you. And she's right. There's like, if it swings. Between 60 and 63 degrees. About that. Okay. Right. Yeah. So yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, I'll back off on the complaining, okay. but it, I'm, what I was trying to emphasize yes. is how good it feels down here. It's great. Yes. Yeah. And, uh, you know, school's out for the summer. Yes. Right. And you're, you're out there enjoying the life of a, a temporarily unemployed professor until mm-hmm. things, you know, swing back in, in the fall. So oh, yeah, life is good. Life is good. Lots right. of, lots of idle time on yeah. my hands. And yeah. how am I doing? Oh, well, thanks for asking. You don't uh, even let me get a word. Okay, in. go ahead. Dave, how you doing? I'm doing great. Good. Just, just came back from a, a vacation. Nice. I was down in the Caribbean. Yeah. Uh, visiting some family on the islands of Trinidad and Tobago. Go. Um, really interesting. There wasn't really any Greek and Latin involved other than the reading that I did on the trip, but had a fantastic time uh, eating and uh, sun tanning and seeing the family. It was, it was a lot of fun. You look tan, rested, and ready. Thanks, I am. All and right. speaking of ready, yes. we have today a really special treat. Yes, I'm excited about this. We Today we are interviewing uh, one Marguerite Fox, who is the author of this wonderful book uh, uh, called the, the Riddle of the Labyrinth. Um, the, the Quest uh, to Crack an Ancient Code. Yes. And it's um, it's one of these great popularizing texts right. that is academically serious, yes. but is also an absolute page turner at the mm-hmm. same time. Pulls no punches in terms of explaining how um, Alice Kober, Michael Ventris, solved this riddle of Linear B. Mm-hmm. And uh, as we know, uh, Ms. Fox was a, a writer at the New York Times for 24 years yep. and wrote the obituaries. Right. And she, and a lot of them, I was looking into her background, um, not just obituaries of people that you know had died in the moment, but right. she wrote a lot of kind of these historical um, um, obituaries of people that were kind of unsung and, right. and who she thought deserved um, more and better press. You know, a lot of these obituaries are written in advance and then they add, just add in the final details and it goes out the door. Like a Mad Lib. I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But one of these obituaries that she wrote was for this Alice Kober, right. um, which one of the, the wonderful things this book uh, brings to light is the really the untold story right. of the work of this woman and the foundations that, that she built um, that really um, were necessary for the solving and the cracking of the code of, of the script of Linear B. Right. Yeah. So what do you think, Jeff, about um, doing our ads now before we get into the interview so as not to interrupt the flow? I think that's a fine idea. Okay. So we're going to skip the bumper music. If you love that bumper music as we do, just go back and listen to other episodes. It's widely available. Yeah, yeah. come on. Come All on. right. So this episode is brought to you by? Uh, Hackett Publishing. Okay. Uh, the Hackett Publishing. These guys have been with us from almost the beginning of, of our little podcast here. Um, they uh, are, are famous for producing um, uh, affordable and accessible and beautiful uh, copies of not just classical works, but from uh, works from all corners of academia. That's correct. Yep. I love their works. We use them extensively for our series on the Aeneid, yeah. for our series on the Odyssey and the Iliad, for our discussion of Ovid's Metamorphoses, Stanley Lombardo, and the uh, the Ambrose translation of that wonderful work. Mm-hmm. They've got it all. They do. And uh, listener, if you want to do two things, if you want to score yourself some high quality, good value reading material, and secondly, if you want to support this podcast, yes, uh, what we do here is a labor of love. We enjoy it, and um, getting the classics out to the masses, to the classical gourmands. Here's what you need to do: you need to go to hackettpublishing.com. Uh, Hackett is H-A-C-K-E-T-T publishing.com. Um, scroll through the website and and look at the, the the myriad of choices there. Find what you want. Drop it in the little satchel there. And if you type in the coupon code A N. 2023, ad nauseum, the current year, uh, that will get you what, Dave? 20% off and, and free shipping. Free shipping. Don't hesitate. 
That's right. And this episode of Ad Nauseum is also brought to you by Ratio Coffee. Now, Jeff, mm -hmm. I told you I was on vacation the yeah. last 10 days or so. Yes. And my loving family uh, down in the Caribbean were so kind to provide me with different coffee options because they know I love coffee. Yeah. yeah. So they provided me with some instant coffee, some drip coffee. They worked very hard at it, and I was very appreciative. Yes. And yet. I feel like there was, feel like there was a butt coming. <laughs> well, I don't, you know, I don't want to be rude because yeah. it was a labor of love. And sure. Who can ever be um, discouraged by people trying to serve you? Exactly. When I returned home, I returned to my racial eight and I had a happy caffeinated reunion. I, I bet you did. Was it sitting there almost like glowing on your countertop? Kind, kind of. of a, a, like a, a lighthouse beacon? It smirked at me a little bit. Oh, where, it did? Where you been? Right. You know? <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. I quickly ground some beans in my barazza grinder and I put it in the cone and I put it underneath the Fibonacci head and I waited for the metallic veins and you know the you know the whole routine. Of course I do. Yeah. I, I, and, and, and let me guess, it was it was pretty much the perfect cup of coffee. It was the perfect cup of coffee. <laughs> yeah. Well, it was very nice of your relatives to think of you in that way. Yes. But in the back of your mind, you were thinking... You know, this is great, and I appreciate it. However, I know what's waiting for me at home. Well, you, you could put it like that. Okay. I mean, right. I, don't, I don't want to sound too negative, because, again, anybody who, you know, perceives this guy likes coffee, let's let's help him out. That is so sweet. It is. Yeah. It is. It is. Yeah. But you had a cup this morning. I did from my ratio eight. Right. And it was it was wonderful. Right. I, I, I made a, I actually made a couple of pots this morning. Oh, really? It was one of those, it was one of those kinds of mornings. Oh. It was the boy's last day of school. Doing so. your taxes or something a month late? Well, it was, we just needed extra energy just to get the kids out, out the door right. this morning. Uh, so I made a, um, basically a pot for my wife and a pot for myself. And yeah, it's just, it's great. It's consistent mm -hmm. and it's just a, a, a great cup every single time. Can't miss. So if our listener want, our listeners want to uh, up their coffee game, yep. leave behind the Dak and Blecker, the Senior Coffee and other kind of squirty plastic Scorchy machines. Scorchy patty. Yes. yes. Kindle bricky, brackish. Tang. Yes. What yes. do they need to do? They need to go to ratiocoffee.com, R-A-T-I-O coffee.com and um, find uh, the machine that you want, the ratio six or the eight. And if you put in the coupon code uh, ANCOA6, what does the A stand A6. for? A6. The A stands for awesome. Awesome. Excellent. Yes. And that will get you 15% uh, off your entire order. That's correct. You don't want to miss this. So, Jeff, without further ado, let's welcome Margo to the program. Let's do it. And uh, we are so grateful that you have agreed uh, to join us this afternoon for a brief conversation about uh, the riddle of the labyrinth. And just to give you a little bit of a background, um, Jeff read this how many years ago? Uh, I think three years ago. Yes. And I just read it this spring, and I have to say it was absolutely riveting. It was so well done. Oh, thank you. I'm delighted that people are still reading it because it oh, came yes. out in 2013, a, a full decade ago now. So that's mar <laughs> that's marvelous. Well, we're classicists, you know, so a full decade ago is just like a moment in terms of uh, our usual things that we read. So That's right. It's not even a hiccup. That's right. And uh, uh, we were both familiar broadly with the story of its decipherment, but I was mostly familiar with Michael Ventris and his role in it. And I thought that the way you told the story of Alice Kober, am I pronouncing her name correctly? Yes. Yes. The story of Alice Kober, that was handled with so much grace and uh, wisdom because you managed to tell how it is that Alice was absolutely instrumental to the decipherment, but at the same time, you didn't um, diminish the contributions of the other scholars. I thought that was really deft. Well, thank you. And it, it's such a meta commentary on how the history that most of us know is by definition written by the victors. Right. And I had done linguistics in school. I'd grown up knowing a little bit about the famous linear B decipherment through Chadwick's volume about Ventris and the decipherment mm -hmm. because Chadwick post decipherment worked closely with Ventris. Chadwick was a philologist of early Greek dialects. Ventris, of course, was an outsider. He was an architect. So as he said, I will be very glad of a philologist to keep me on the right lines. So I knew that book. And in, I guess, about 2010, when I was casting around for what to write a new book on, I remembered the story of Linear B. All I knew was Michael Ventris. Hmm, right. So I did a little bit of research and I discovered that the primary archive in this country for documents relating to the decipherment was held by the program in Aegean Scripts and Prehistory at the University of Texas at Austin. Hmm. So I called over there 
and spoke to the brilliant classicist who runs that archive, Tom Palima of U Texas. I explained who I was, and I said, I'd like to do a book on the Linear B decipherment. May I come to Austin and run around in your archive? And Tom said something that stopped me in my tracks. He said, Hmm. you know, it's a godsend that you called when you did, because we have just now finished cataloging the papers of Alice Kober. Uh And I said naively, who's that? (laughs) And he told me, and I confess that I gnashed my teeth privately for about 24 hours because my entire conception of the book, which had been the Michael Venter's story, right. had to be ripped up and upended and completely rethought. And hmm. then I realized, idiot, you have this extraordinary piece of American women's history here yes. that very few people, even in the classics world, know much about. Right. Hmm. Well, that's fascinating. And um, our audience generally, I think, are, are probably going to need a little bit of catching up on the basic rudiments of uh, the discovery of Linear B. And rather than, you know, us kind of uh, talking them through that, I'm hoping that that you could kind of give us, you know, your your book pitch that you took to the publisher, the, the 32nd or 62nd What is it and why it's important? I think you're probably uniquely qualified for that. Mm -hmm. Before we jump into that, I'm wondering, uh, it's it's a question we we, uh, ask um, pretty much everybody we interview is, um, so it's very clear that, uh, I mean, you're a linguist, you you had a deep interest in languages. Uh, Long before you came to this project, your first book was on sign language. Um, But uh, did did you have any kind of classical background? Did you take any Greek and Latin um, in your in your studies? I took a tiny bit of Latin as an undergraduate, but I did most of my work in Germanic, um, the only quasi-ancient language I studied as an undergrad wasn't really an ancient language by that time. It was modern Hebrew. Uh, So I had done no Greek whatsoever, and certainly not Mycenaean Greek, because who does Mycenaean Greek? (laughs) So, um, you know, who even does Homeric Greek? And Mycenaean, of course, is half a millennium earlier than that. Right. Mm. Um, So when I got the contract to do the book, I went to the CUNY Grad Center's summer Greek and Latin intensive. And ultimately, I wound up working instead with a private tutor, a lovely young man who was Mm. then a postdoc uh, or no, a doctoral candidate in Greek at CUNY. And I was then a reporter for the New York Times. So he would come to the New York Times building before I started my newsroom day. We would sit in the sun. He was a a poor scholar, so I would buy him breakfast. We'd sit in the sun <laughs> and conjugate and decline for an hour a couple of times uh, a week. It was it was heaven. I would do uh, I've forgotten most of my Greek, but and Lord knows it was the most paradigmatic language I have ever yeah. had the good fortune slash misfortune to learn. But <laughs> I, I loved it. I'd do it again in a red second. Huh. Huh. Great. Yeah. So the uh, the the thirty the thirty second the sixty second. Uh, you know what was the mm-hmm. elevator pitch kind of when you went to the publishers and said, "I'm writing this story, and here's why it has mass appeal. Here's why it's interesting." Well, it's a real Indiana Jones story. In 1900, the great English archaeologist Arthur Evans, digging at Heraklion on Crete, unearthed these extraordinary Bronze Age clay tablets. When one of his local workmen dug up the first one, he brushed it off, handed it to Evans and said, Gramata, writing. Mm. Mm. And there on the tablets were inscribed these weird symbols, horses' heads, things that look like philodendron leaves and to us like telegraph poles, all sorts of strange pictograms. Not only did they not know what the tablet said, they didn't even know what language they recorded because many ethnic groups had passed through the Bronze Age Aegean and there was no simple way to tell whose language these tablets represented. So what you have, thrillingly, is the linguistic equivalent of a locked room mystery. Hmm. There's no bilingual 
inscription akin to the Rosetta Stone, which right. helped decipher the hieroglyph of ancient Egypt. Nothing like that was ever found. So you're literally lying blind. And the question for the decipherer becomes, how do you ever finesse your way into this tightly closed system where there is no linguistic key available in terms of knowledge of whose culture it was, knowledge of whose language it was, knowledge of what the inscription said, knowledge of what they meant. Hmm. None of that is known. So that's a really scary situation. And it took over 50 years for this hmm. strange writing to be deciphered. Hmm. Yeah, thank you so much uh, for that, you know, that outline. I, I loved the way that you ordered the book by focusing on the characters, the character of Evans, the character of uh, Cobra, and the character of Ventress. And I think of the three, uh, Cobra, maybe because of her untimely death, well, I guess Ventress is as well, but she was she was the most sympathetic. I mean, her enormous work ethic and industry, um, I, if I'm remembering correctly, it's been only a few months the, the index cards that she kept of every one of the little symbols, sometimes using scraps of paper, uh, just whatever she could find in a, a post-World uh, War II environment where paper was uh, expensive. Can you talk a little bit about some of those early stages of her work as it's laid out in the book? Alice Cobra is the great unsung heroine of the Linear B decipherment. It's often said now, and I think with some justification, that she was the Rosalind Franklin of the Linear B story. Uh, Michael Ventris, using the methods that Cobra devised, ultimately deciphered the script in 1952 and, of course, has gotten the glory ever since, right. quite rightly. But for various reasons, partly having to do with women's history, partly having to do with the fact that she died very young, Within a hair's breadth of deciphering the script herself, Cobra's work has, by and large, been lost to public consciousness. Hmm. Alice Cobra was an overworked, underpaid professor of classics at the newly created Brooklyn College. She joined their faculty in 1930. She had a PhD in classics from Columbia. And it appears that even when she was an undergraduate, she was aware of the Linear B story and was infatuated with it. And on her graduation from Hunter College here in New York in the 1920s, she boldly announced to whoever would listen that she mm. would one day decipher the riddle of this mysterious Bronze Age script. And it must be said wow. she came very, very close. Huh. Huh. So oh, that's working, fascinating. She was saddled with an immense teaching load, five classes at a time. Your listeners will know what that feels like, many right. of them. And night after night, after her hundreds of papers were graded, her lecture notes had been written up, she sat at the dining table of the house she shared with her widowed mother in the Flatbush section of Brooklyn and constantly burning cigarette at her elbow. She poured over these strange Cretan inscriptions. One of the mistakes that earlier would-be decipherers made was to try to ascribe a language to Linear B. Mm -hmm. And there were wild theories that by both professional and amateur would-be decipherers that it wrote everything from ancient Hittite to Polynesian. And as Cobra realized, because she had a steel trap mind, that was looking at the problem through the wrong end of the telescope. As she said, if you start with a thesis about what language the tablets record, you can twist the characters in the script into yeah. any gyration to fit that thesis, as she said, excluding the possibility that half a dozen other theses are just as likely. Right. She vowed very early to dwell in a world, as she so beautifully called it, of form without meaning. Hmm. The only thing she was interested in was compiling a scenery of the characters of the script for decades. No one knew exactly how many characters there were because hmm. there were various scribes in this ancient Cretan kingdom. Some of them had good handwriting, some of them didn't. Uh, Cobra herself, for instance, 
spent years agonizing over whether one particular character was the same character or two different characters when it whether it had a single crossbar or two crossbars. Mm. That was the microscopic level on which she had to work. Working uh, with the young scholar Emmett Bennett at Yale, she eventually compiled a signery. It was clear from the number of characters that this was a syllabic script. Even Arthur Evans knew that way back in the early 1900s. And then she cut out 180,000 homemade index cards. The reason they were homemade was during the war and for years afterwards, her seminal work was done in the mid-1940s, paper was rationed. It was a very scarce mm -hmm. commodity. They needed the chemicals that went into paper making to make other things for the war effort. And the paper you could get was terrible, as Cobra laments in mm -hmm. her correspondence. It wouldn't even hold ink. So using the back of greeting cards, church circulars, um, it must be said, a lot of checkout slips that she pinched from the Brooklyn College Library. <laughs> On the back of these, she would notate by hand every statistic on every frequency count, on every character of the script in every inscription then known. Mm -hmm. Frequency at the beginnings of words, the middles, at the ends, in combination with every other character. She and she was literally, literally sitting there with a slide rule, doing these calculations by hand. Incredible. She, yeah, one hundred and eighty thousand. Huh. One hundred and eighty thousand. Sadly, she stored her cards in file ersatz file boxes made from the one paper product that she had a lot of, and that was empty cigarette cartons. And they're mm. now archived at the University of Texas. Mm. And you can, I've opened up these file boxes and they say, you know, LSMFT on the front. Lucky strike mm. means fine tobacco. And <laughs> you open them up and you're still met with this whiff of 1940s cigarettes. Uh. Huh. Wow. Yeah. So I want to I want to read a quote from Chapter Five, uh, a delightful problem, and um, it's it's very much in line with what you were just saying. One thing Cobra did not bring along. This is on her trip to England. Was the mountain of publications about Linear B that had sprung up in the half century since Evans unearthed the tablets? Quote: Everything that's been written on Minoan is in my files, and much of it is completely worthless. She had written Myers before she left New York. Quote, the useful things I know practically by heart. So that speaks to what you were saying about her um, voluminous memory uh, and or steel trap mind. I think you said words to that effect. Um, and then her just enormous industry and in cataloging all of these uh, fine items and then calculating the statistics. That was just it's unbelievable how much industry she had. And there are two amazing things about that trip. Um, Myers, by the way, was Sir John Myers, who had been. Arthur Evans's young assistant in the early Cretan excavations and after Evans' death in 1941, succeeded him as the custodian of the Minoan script and was the grand old man of Minoan archaeology by this point. Arthur Evans sat on his data. He published very few of the inscriptions clearly by design, by proprietary design. Mm. Uh, he didn't want other scholars horning in on his best efforts to decipher the script, which, although he worked on it continuously for 40 years, he never made any headway. It, he wasn't a linguist. He was a digger, a, bril a brilliant digger, but mm -hmm. he wasn't a philologist. So Kober and the few other serious scholars around the world who desperately craved to decipher the script had their hands tied. There were very few published inscriptions for them to work from. After Arthur Evans died in 1941, Cobra wrote this very tentative, very beseeching letter to his successor, Sir John Myers, saying, you know, is there any chance I can see the scripts? Uh, to her amazement, he granted her permission. And in 1946, she won a Guggenheim and used that to take time off from her teaching load, sailed to Britain, where she was going to see inscriptions firsthand for the first time. What blew my mind was there weren't 
ubiquitous Xerox machines then. You, right. in, in any case, you couldn't take a 3,000-year-old clay tablet and, and put it on a copier. So she knew that any inscription she was going to snare, she would have to copy by hand. Yeah. So when she was still at home in Brooklyn, she prepared for her England trip like an athlete preparing for the Olympics, where she would literally copy as fast as she could, as accurately as she could, the few inscriptions that were available. And she writes in one letter, I timed myself, and I think I can copy 100 to 150 inscriptions in a 12-hour day. That was <laughs> that was the rigor that she put herself through, all yeah. in the name of intellectual advancement, in the name of solving this mm. gripping problem. Hmm. Now, was it was it Myers uh, who um, published the two volumes of Script in Manoa that Kober worked on as well? Or was that right. Evans? It was I... Myers in collaboration. Evans was dead by this time. It was Myers in collaboration with Ventris. And uh, mm -hmm. on uh, an England visit, Kober and Ventris met for the first and only time. And it was very clear that they didn't like each other. And I think, as I say in the book, it's clear that each underestimated the other rather deeply. Mm -hmm. He, sad to say, this was the 1940s, underestimated her because she was a woman. And she underestimated him because he was that most damnable of creatures, an amateur. And indeed, when one is an archaeological decipherer, one has good cause to be wary of amateurs because she had right. see whenever she published a paper, she gets ceaseless correspondence from these crackpots uh, who, you know, thought right. linear B recorded Polynesian or whatever. And out of good manners and also fealty to trying to advance their real understanding of the problem, she took precious time out from her long days to answer them. Were, was any of that, um, the correspondence uh, that she received after she published her papers, was that part of the archive that you were able to study in Texas? All of her correspondence is in the archive. Um, okay. She, Tom Palima, who is a brilliant mycenologist, uh, a number of years ago received a MacArthur Award, and he used his MacArthur money to travel all over the world and buy up archives relating to the decipherment. Mm. And from his mentor, Emmett Bennett, who had been uh, a young collaborator of Alice Cobers, he was able to get access to a lot of Cobers papers. Because Bennett got them mm. after she died. Alice died uh, very young, so we don't know quite what of, uh, as I discovered to my dismay, the cause of death is redacted in New York City death certificates of the period, but it seems pretty clear from her history of chain smoking. It was almost certainly some type of cancer. I was able to mm -hmm. interview a much younger cousin who had been a child when Alice died. And this woman who was by then in her 70s said it had been whispered among the older women in the family that Alice had some rare form of cancer. And she died when she, in uh, 1950, two years before Ventress deciphered the script at the age of only 43. It's absolutely mm. gut wrenching. Wow. Yeah. Mm. Another really sad part of the story that you tell well, despite its sadness, is uh, her inability to get a secure academic position. I think it was Bennett who was working constantly. And I, I can't remember, was it at Harvard that he was trying to secure her a position? Uh, no, you're thinking of John Franklin Daniel, the uh, young classicist who tried to get her a position at Penn, at Penn, the University of Pennsylvania. And she basically, as he said, you if it's scan consolation, but you came in second on everyone's list. But mm -hmm. they hired um, the philologist Henry Honingswald instead. Okay. Uh, and as she laments in her correspondence, she said, it is too bad that the kind of work I really want to do, in other words, pure research, is available only to men. Mm. This was in the 1940s. So she was stuck teaching, you know, classics in translation in, you know, right. five sections. There's a devastating letter that I 
reprise in the book where she's writing to her department chairman to ask to be excused from some routine assignment, probably proctoring. And so in order to make her case, she lists her schedule for that week. And it's literally giving exams in five sections, grading literally hundreds of tests and papers, preparing lectures, preparing her own academic work. And it's just her work was her entire life. It consumed her in every sense. Well, the uncomplaining, um, although sad, the uncomplaining devotion to duty and her devotion to her students, it's really remarkable. And, And it's definitely a hallmark of another era, it seemed to me. I just can't imagine... Uh, most folks doing that so willingly. I, I'm, I'm sure she wasn't always willing, but with such precision and, and constancy, that was very impressive. She was a very moral person, clearly. For instance, uh, one of one of the extra things she did that she really didn't have to do is a blind student at Brooklyn College wanted to study Horace. So she taught herself Braille and she started brailing all of the texts for her work with him. And then because she knew Braille, the college asked her to start brailing textbooks and exams for all of the blind students at college. She did that. And it could take probably 15 hours to braille a single exam. Braille Mm -hmm. is a very, very minute, you know, tedious, time consuming way to write. Mm-hmm. Uh, the other thing she did that I just love is she would correspond with the few European colleagues whose work she held in esteem. Uh, the Finnish scholar Johannes Sundwald was one, and she was painfully aware of the post-war shortages that they continued to labor under. So mm-hmm. much like Helene Hemp in 84 Charing Cross Road, she would make up these care packages to send to these European colleagues she'd never met. She'd mm-hmm. write to Sundwald. Uh, I'm sending you an orange, which I'm coating in wax so it can withstand the trip to Finland. Um, This, to me, you know, when one trains as a journalist, your professors always tell you, look for the telling detail. In one letter, she says to Zunval, I'm sending you a jar of Nescafe. And the letter is typed, but then by hand, she's taken the trouble to handwrite the acute accent on the final E of Nescafe. (laughs) And that little stroke of a millimeter to me says more about Alice Kober and her intellectual fealty than anything in the whole corpus of her work. Yeah, very well said. Very well said. Margaret, I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about, um, I'm I'm just interested in just kind of the the tangible nature of, you know, like you said, you you handled the... um, the, the cigarette carton boxes and you could smell the smell the the tobacco and just how um, handling the the archives and seeing these little details were there, were there other things and just kind of the um, your physical connection with that stuff that that kind of shaped uh, your your kind of your your sense of who this woman was it's very moving they have in addition to all of the cigarette boxes of her hundred and eighty thousand cards um, Some of the cards tell stories as one of the archivists who assembled that collection at Texas discovered in one case, because she was making these ersatz cards out of, you know, found paper objects, Alice took the trouble to, from an old greeting card, cut out a picture of a fawn on a bed of flowers and perfectly center it to use as a tap divider. She Mm. didn't have to do that. Uh, The Archive at Texas also has a powder compact of hers. And we think of her as only having a life of the mind. And I don't think generally she was too concerned with how she looked or with primping or putting on airs. But Mm -hmm. there's a powder compact. And, of course, there's one of her own hairs that got caught in it. So there Mm. are these, these little bits of her. And Mm. yeah, indeed, it's very moving. There are a few published photographs of Alice Cooper. I'm very, very proud that one of the things I was happened to be aware of as a lifelong New Yorker is that until well into the 1950s, Brooklyn had its own daily paper, the Brooklyn Eagle. There were, of course, many 
Brooklyn papers back in the 19th century when it was a separate city. But the, the one, the Brooklyn Eagle, endured until the 50s. And I thought Alice Kober won a Guggenheim in the mid-1940s. Wouldn't it be possible for the Brooklyn paper to have done a kind of local girl makes good story? Yeah. And their archive, their morgue is now owned by Brooklyn Public Library. And sure enough, there is a gorgeous silver gelatin print of Alice Cobra that was shot for that very story huh. in the Brooklyn Eagle. So that uh, has been reproduced in my book and it's now hanging up in the archive of you, Texas. Ah, oh, so this is right before chapter four. I'm looking at this. She's seated at um, a desk. She's looking off to, I think, her right. And she has open, probably it's posed, a book of um, maybe it's uh, Linear B that she's looking at or something. something. Yeah, un unclear. Yeah, look, it's a very stagey photograph and, she, photograph and she looks suitably uncomfortable. But uh, <laughs> it's it's all we have. And we're lucky even right. to have that. Well, turning uh, in the direction of Ventress for a moment, not because he's more interesting, uh, in 2018, my son and I visited Cambridge. Uh, he was, I think, 11 or 12 at the time. And I th I'm not sure which museum it is in, but it was the first time I had seen the desk at which Ventress worked uh, when he, in fact, succeeded in um, uh, deciphering the language. And, of course, I had a, there a moment of... Um, you know, reverence as I thought. So this is the the very place where he worked when he was able to uh, to solve the riddle. So could you move into a little bit more of some of the the technical aspects of the philology behind how Ventress using Cobra's work was able to puzzle this out? I mean, I followed it when I read the book. It's fairly complicated, but I'm sure that you can explain it in a way that our readers will appreciate, our listeners will appreciate. <laughs> you're you're a print guy like me. I assume the desk was this uh, high modernist Marcel Breuer table. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yes. As uh, Ventress was um, pretty well to do, which I think is the other reason Cober mm. found it distasteful to be around him because there she was toiling away right. just to earn her bread and support her mother, and he was. Seemingly, this kind of rich dilettante, but in fact, mm. he was a great deal more than that. Before Cobra died, she was able to make a couple of really vital discoveries about the script. And one was, although we had no idea what the sound value of any character was or how any word should be pronounced, what any word meant, purely by studying the Oh, internal relations of the script, this form without meaning, she demonstrated conclusively in a published paper that the language Linear B recorded, whatever it might have been, had been an inflected language. In other words, that it had suffixal grammar, just as mm -hmm. we know from Latin and Greek and German and all of those good languages that we've all studied. Right. Jumping off from there... Ventress started doing something that Cobra had been too conservative to do. I think rightly conservative, but because he was an outsider, he wasn't from the philology world, that kind of gave him carte blanche to assign provisional sound values to some of these characters. Um, he worked out, for instance something that no other investigator had determined. It was well known, even in the days of Arthur Evans, that first of all, the Linear B script was a syllabic script, a syllabary. Mm -hmm. And there are different types of, of syllabaries. And it was also well known that Linear B was what's called a CV syllabary. That is right. that every consonant stands for the exact combination, every character, pardon me, stands for the exact combination of one consonant plus one vowel, CV, CV, CV. Right. If I, if I can interrupt you for just a second, I'm sorry, just for the sake of our audience, um, a syllabary is distinct from a, a pictographic or ideographic language, right, in which a single character represents an idea, which would be, as I understand, more like Mandarin, where there's a, a, a single symbol that represents something like a mountain. And by putting these together, you form syntax, unlike a syllabary. We must take exceptional care to distinguish between a language and a writing system. 
You know, we okay. are speakers of the English language. However, our writing system is the Roman alphabet. So it must be remembered mm. that the problem uh, these decipherers were working to solve was rooted in a writing system, not in a language, because the language was perforce unknown. And so there are mm -hmm. three major types of writing systems, and all of the world's languages that have written forms are one of these types of systems or some combination of them. So indeed, mm -hmm. and what distinguishes them is what chunk of the linguistic si signal each character represents. So indeed, a logographic writing system, as is used, for example, for Chinese, one character stands for one word. So in such systems, you will have tens of thousands of characters because pretty much every discrete item in the lexicon of that language has to have a discrete character. The next right. system mm -hmm. down bites off a smaller chunk of the linguistic signal, and that's a syllabic system or a syllabary, where each character stands for a syllable like ma or pa or bo, um, the Cherokee syllabary invented by Chief Sequoia is a classic example. And again, character mm -hmm. count is a good diagnostic. Syllabic systems, because of what each character represents, generally have between about 80 and 200 characters. Once um, a signery, an inventory of all the discrete characters of Linear B was known, it had about 85 characters. That puts it squarely within the embrace of a syllabic system. And then, of course, the third type of writing system that bites off the smallest chunk of all is what we English speakers know well. That's an right. alphabet where a character, by and large, stands for a single sound. And again, character count mm -hmm. is key. Alphabets, the number of characters is only in the dozens, as we with our 26 mm -hmm. characters in the Roman writing system know well. It was known mm, yes. from the very beginning that Linear B was syllabic and known also that it was a CV type of syllabary where each character stands for one consonant plus one vowel. So CV, CV, CV. That's fine right. as far as it goes, as long as the word you're writing starts with a consonant. But what happens mm -hmm. if you have to write a word that starts with a vowel, you're in big trouble unless, and this was Ventress's first great epiphany, and he was absolutely right. There are a few characters in that otherwise CV system that stand for pure vowels. And he identified five characters that recurred with particular frequency at the beginnings of words. It's just like you or I doing a cryptogram in our Sunday paper and seeing where in a word does mm -hmm. this character fall and he identified right. five that of course were for the five pure vowels a e i o u that was one discovery mm. another discovery he made and this turned out to be the linchpin of the whole decipherment was cober had rightly discovered that the language Linear B recorded was an inflected language. She was talking about grammatical inf inflections, case, number, that right. sort of thing. Uh, just as if I were speaking Spanish and I would say, hablo, I speak, quiero, I want, where that O suffix encodes the grammatical information, first person, singular. Now, Ventress took that one step further. He said, what if some of these similar looking words that had been pulled out of the tablets, what if they were not grammatical inflections, but derivational inflections? In this case, mm. related forms of Cretan place names, forms analogous to London, Londoner or Brooklyn, Brooklynite, Brooklynese. What he conjectured, and it was a brilliant conjecture, was it was well known in Evans's day that the tablets were the documentary records, the municipal documents, if you will, of this ancient 
Bronze Age Cretan kingdom. And he thought, mm-hmm. well, what would be on a municipal document? And as I say when I speak about this story, if I look at the municipal documents in my life, a uh, marriage certificate, local tax forms, a, a billion and one jury summonses, they – Exactly. I live in Manhattan and they all have one thing in common. Somewhere on them, very prominently, they'll say city of New York. So Ventress thought, aha, if these are Cretan municipal documents, what if these related looking forms of words on the tablets that differ only in their final characters, what if they are derivational forms of Cretan place names? So experimenting further with assigning sound values to characters, he started plugging in place names. One of the first ones he worked out was a three-character word that was the symbols ko, no, so. Say that fast, knosso, knossos. The principal city of Cretan antiquity and the very place where the tablets were first unearthed. And just as in a Sudoku puzzle where you plug in a few values and suddenly you get a chain reaction that gives you all these other values, he started plugging in sound values and lo and behold, other Cretan place names masked before his eyes. And Mm. in the summer, just about this time, it was early June 1952, he took the microphone at BBC Radio and announced to the world this remarkable discovery that these Bronze Age tablets unearthed on Crete recorded a very early dialect of Greek spoken 500 years before Homer's time and a full thousand years before the glories of classical Athens. It was an outcome that no one had considered. No one knew Hellenic peoples existed that early. If, if I can read from chapter 12 here, a quote, because that's it's right where you're speaking of now. This is page 248, and this is uh, Ventress on the BBC broadcast. For a long time, I thought that Etruscan, right, one of the dead ends, might afford the clue we were looking for. But during the last few years, I have come to the conclusion that the Knossos and Pilos tablets must, after all, be written in Greek. A difficult and archaic Greek, seeing that it is 500 years older than Homer, and written in a rather abbreviated form, but Greek nevertheless. Once I made this assumption, most of the peculiarities of the language and spelling which had puzzled me seemed to find a logical explanation. So that's the end of the quote, and then your words. What Ventress disclosed in the broadcast was breathtaking. Well before the Greek language was thought to exist, the first Greek-speaking people, unruly and unlettered, swarmed into Crete. There they appropriated one of the indigenous writing systems, Linear A, that had flourished on the island for generations. Yeah, what kind of an impact did that have then when he made this announcement? It was big news. It was world news. It was earth shaking. No one had conceived that it could be Greek for, you know, authentic historical reasons. They didn't think Greek speakers were around that early. And also um, political reasons where Arthur Evans was so in love with this Minoan civilization, he unearthed on Crete and he, you know, spent his fortune rebuilding, you know, his fantasy of what these, the palace of Minos had supposedly looked like, that, you know, his word was law, Um, you know, this this Cretan civilization and therefore the writing on their tablets couldn't possibly be Greek because his civilization was so much more advanced and just so much better than these <laughs> rude, unlettered mainland Greeks. And indeed, these Greek conquistadors poured into Crete, saw that these Cretans whom they were overrunning had this almost magical way of taking spoken language and trapping it for all eternity in wet Mm. clay so that it could be read again. Mm. And they had to, we still don't know what language Linear A recorded, what that indigenous Cretan language was, but it was clearly not at all related to Greek because one of the reasons the tablets didn't look like Greek for the longest time was the Greek conquistadors had to put this writing system that wasn't designed to record Greek through all sorts of 
orthographic gyrations. And, mm-hmm. you know, they had to kind of cheat the spellings of Greek words to get, as, as I think I say, the the square peg of linear B to fit into the round hole of Greek. Mm-hmm. So that was another reason decipherers just weren't looking toward a Greek solution. It was huge news, uh, but it caused it made Ventris a world celebrity, but it also caused him tremendous anxiety because he mm-hmm. was an outsider. He was an architect who had never been to university in those years architectural training in Britain anyway was done in professional schools, not in the universities. So he had a tremendous inferiority complex, even though he was drop dead brilliant. And uh, of course, whenever anyone comes out in public with a solution to a problem that has been a worldwide puzzle for 50 years, naysayers come out of the woodwork. And so he had a lot of Um, self-doubt. So he makes the solution in 1952. And in 1956, when he's only 34, he is killed in a rather bizarre, swift, high-speed car accident that – remains the subject of debate to this day and right. many, many observers think and I am some at least someone inclined to think that it was suicide because at that point he was clearly we know from his correspondence very depressed uh, and absolutely wrecked by self-doubt it, it's what we might call today the imposter syndrome hmm. even though his solution was brilliant and absolutely correct hmm. what were some of the objections from academia at the time, um, to Ventress's solution. Well, to put it in a very short form, modern terms, you know, it's it couldn't be Greek. You're an idiot. You know, get <laughs> your hands out of our classical pies, you interloper, you. Gotcha, gotcha. gotcha. <laughs> so, really, really high level, careful, and, and reasonable criticisms. Well, there there <laughs> were many more reasonable criticisms than that, and of course, Ventress. Yeah. Ventress, because he was brilliant, was his own worst critic. Uh, as sure. uh, the, the mycenologist Professor Palima says, Ventress was painfully aware that he himself had had only three years of schoolboy mm. Greek, and he was putting this solution out into the world of Oxford and Cambridge yeah. PhDs. Right. Um, that would make anyone shake in his boots. Sure, sure. And... Ventress was in many ways his own worst critic. He was brilliant. One of the things, for instance, that he agonized over before he announced the solution as being Greek was he thought it couldn't be Greek because I'm not seeing anything in these inscriptions that looks like a definite article. There's no familiar ho he to in this. Mm -hmm. And Chadwick, who joined him later after hearing the announcement on the BBC, was able to reassure him. He said, even in Homer's day, half a millennium later, um, the definite article wasn't as ubiquitous as it later became in mm-hmm. inscription. So, mm-hmm. But Ventress was conscientious enough and learned enough to agonize over every one of these seeming discrepancies. And then plus all of the brickbats that were coming from the outside whenever a scholar, particularly a scholar from outside the field, makes a big discovery. Right. I thought you handled um, that part of the book especially well, telling the story um, of his death and, you know, presenting the arguments for and against uh, whether it was an accident or whether it was deliberate. I thought that was very, very tastefully and well done. And um, so Evans, Evans died, you said, in 41. So that's uh, about a, a little more than a decade before the decipherment. I suppose it's good for Ventress that Evans wasn't around at that time because who knows how Evans may have reacted to uh, this 30-year-old um, solving, based on Kober's work, solving something that had perplexed scholars for, I guess, nearly 50 years. Right. Evans died in 1941, um, heartbreakingly, just weeks before the Nazis poured into Crete. And of course, you know, what do you do when you conquer someplace? You take over the best house. Right. And so they took over the palatial Villa Ariadne that he Evans had built for himself on mm. Crete near Heraklion, and mm. that became Nazi command headquarters. So at least, thank God, he didn't live to see that. 
Yeah, mm. M- much like the the um, is it the Menelion in Athens that Schle- Schliemann. Schliemann built, and yep. now it's a numismatic museum, very similar. Yeah, okay. Schliemann okay. has a cameo in this story. After his great success unearthing Troy, he wanted to try and do likewise on Crete. And right. as rich as Arthur Evans was, Schliemann was if anything, richer. And what I loved learning in the course of my research is that he had made two fortunes. First, cornering the European indigo market. Uh, that right. was mm-hmm. big money in those days. And then what I really loved, because you wouldn't picture Schliemann in this milieu, he started a bank in Sacramento amid the yeah. California gold rush. So all right. of these literal gold diggers had a place to put their loot. Um, yeah, brilliant. Right. And so yeah. he wanted to buy the very property in Heraklion where Evans eventually dug, but uh, Evans beat him out. So, <laughs> but that's Schliemann's yeah. little cameo. Yeah. Schliemann has this, has this great quote. I think he said, um, he predicted of, um, of Crete. He said, it's a veritable rookery of nations. He, you know, he, perceived that so many different uh, peoples had passed through there because of its geographical position between the three continents. So that was his intuition, but Evans Evans was faster. And personally, I'm I'm glad that Evans got there. <laughs> if Schliemann had gotten there and his hands on it, it would be a very different story, and I'm That's not sure true. if it would be for the better. Hmm. Yeah. Although, in a sense, I won't call what Evans built a theme park, but there's a wonderful quote uh, Pierre Trudeau visited Knossos in the 1960s. And of course, this had all been built really according to Evans's vision and let's say Evans's fantasy in the right. 20s and 30s. And so Pierre Trudeau was a smart guy and he looked at the Palace of Knossos and he said, who knew that the Minoans invented Art Deco? <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's right. Yeah. Well, well Margot, we want to be respectful of your time and we're very grateful for the time that you've given us. And as, as we look toward um wrapping this up a little bit, I think I have um I have two questions that you're you're welcome to um answer however you wish and I'll just put them both out there. The first is, do you want to say anything about the process of writing this book that uh that I'm sure is fascinating and secondly, what are the other projects that you're working on? Well, let me answer the second question because this uh, I'm delighted that you and I hope your listeners are interested still in the Linear B story. But the book itself came out 10 years ago, which meant right. the process <laughs> of writing it is in what is for me, unlike the um, classicist time frame, what is for me the far distant path. <laughs> <laughs> Book I have, all of my books are narrative nonfiction. I wish to heaven I had been born with the fiction gene and could just make stuff up instead of doing years and years of research before I even touch the keyboard. But sadly, I don't have that capability. So it's to narrative nonfiction that I turn every time. My most recent book, which came out in 2021, is called The Confidence Men. And you asked me earlier for the, I hate this term, but the elevator pitch for right. Linear B. The elevator pitch for The Confidence Men is even more succinct and more strange. It's in the depths of World War I, two handsome young British officers escaped from a remote Ottoman POW camp by means of of a Ouija board. Oh my gosh. <laughs> huh. You had me at the phrase in the depths right there. I, I was sold right there. So no, no, Margaret, I read, uh, and uh, hopefully you can confirm this, that you are also, you're working on a screenplay of that book being turned into a film. Is that true? Yes. A couple of my books have been optioned by the movies, but the, the most recent one, The Confidence Men, also option besides the intellectual property of the book itself was my screenplay adaptation. I started training in screenwriting a couple of years ago Hmm. in the hope of being able to retain artistic control and economic control over adaptations of my own work. So uh, it's been very, very thrilling to learn that new genre, which compared to book writing is like writing haiku uh, in a, a narrative nonfiction book might be a hundred thousand words, a two hour feature film adaptation of that same story. You might have 20,000 words, 10,000 mm. of which are scene descriptions. So right. you only have 10,000 words to tell this whole narrative. It, it's right. 
very exacting and, and really a privilege and a thrill to be learning how to do. I'm sure you can do it well. I'll just say that I am a very particular, critical, Jeff can affirm this, ornery kind of reader. <laughs> I don't like it when people give me books because I want to select my own things. I don't want to be obligated. Uh, but when I read your book, I really, really enjoyed it. It was just phenomenal. So I'm sure that you can write a good screenplay. And one of the things that Dave and I talk about all the time, and one of the reasons we started this podcast is we wanted to do something about the classical world, but we also wanted it for a popular audience. And I think that threading that needle of taking a very serious academic subject and writing about it in an engaging, um, you know, page-turning kind of way is a rare skill. And your book is a is a great example of of success in that. So we both loved it. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you. That's immensely encouraging. Sure. And I see in in the background there, uh, Conan Doyle defense. This is another of your works. This. Um the Riddle of the Labyrinth is my second book. Conan Doyle for the Defense is my third, and again, narrative nonfiction about a weirdly little-known wrongful murder conviction for a murder in Glasgow, Scotland in 1908, uh, where a Jewish immigrant was pulled off the street, railroaded, came this close to being hanged, instead mm -hmm. spent 20 years in at hard labor, and his conviction was re-examined and overturned through the personal agency and investigation of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, using, of course, the methods of his uh, most famous character. Well, now I have to read that, but I want to know. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> uh, is there anything classically related in it so that we can have a, an excuse for having you back on the program to talk about <laughs> that book? Oh, gee whiz. I wish there <laughs> were. I can't think of anything. Uh, and then, then the closest I can get with the confidence men, which I'm still mm -hmm. promoting as much as I can, sure. the closest I can get is at Ottoman Empire, but that doesn't mm. quite really do it either. It's closer. It's closer what, than what, Glasgow. What about, a, what about a screenplay for the life of Alice Coburn? Yeah. I mean, as you were talking, it would, it would be, it would be, it seems like such a, it would be a great subject. For well, and film. there's precedent, right, for intellectual films. Think about the films made about Tolkien, right? There's a recent, right. yeah. wasn't, wasn't a great movie. It was not very but, good, but. <laughs> but there's a recent film about Tolkien as, as a young man, and there the many films that Anthony Hopkins has starred in about uh, Cambridge and Oxford Dons and so forth. There's a, there's kind of a Yeah, what about the, the Riddle track. of the Labyrinth? Yeah, have you thought about that? It's, it must have crossed your mind. Uh, I've thought about it. It's something, uh, yeah, it's some, it would take a ferocious amount of rejiggering. It's, as I'm learning, the occupational culture of Hollywood is very, very different from what any of us who come from the academy are used to, mm. even any of us who've had a career in book publishing are are used to. So um, it would take some doing. It is in the back of my mind. Okay. And the manuscript I've just turned in, um, uh, the, so this is my third book, then uh, Confidence Men is my fourth, and the chicken, Mrs. Milligan, is actually in, she's in the Ottoman theater of war in okay. uh, the Confidence Men. Uh, <laughs> and sadly, because the men are starving to death, you kind of can Oh, oh yes. what happens to the chicken? <laughs> well, when it comes when it comes to the rejiggering, though, if you're going to rejigger it for the screen, I will send you boxes of um, index cards so that you don't have to do your rejiggering <laughs> on, uh, you know, receipts Green, from the grocery from store. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be my contribution. <laughs> yeah. And no cigarette boxes. So that's my fourth book. My fifth book I just turned in, and that's about um, an early organized crime boss in 19th century New York operating mm. more than half a century before the accepted, you know, Tommy gun era prohibition right. starting date Capone. So, uh, certainly no classical connection there. Alas, <laughs> we can find one. We'll find something. So, all right. Well, you read them, enjoy them and let me know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I have one question. This just, is just speaks to kind of the quirk of my own interests is that, um, do we know where Alice Kober, um, is buried and have you visited her grave um she was cremated and so we don't know what the disposition of the ashes was so no the sadly there's no mm. grave to visit mm. right but i did read that you i mean you um spent a lot of time you wrote um hundreds of obituaries right for the new york times 
I did. I was, I had a 24 year career at the New York Times, retired in 2018 as a senior writer. And my, my first 10 years, I was in an editor in the Sunday Book Review. And then the last 14 years, I was an obituary writer. And so, indeed, as you all know, it is there every inch about sifting the past. Right. And uh, the reason, you know, we're all old enough to know that obits historically were Siberia in any American newsroom it was where they sent you if they wanted to punch you. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> it's the best beat in, and you can just see there's a wonderful documentary called Obit. You can see the last syllable uh-huh. of oh, it yeah. here um, yeah. about the work of my colleagues and me at the times that mm. came out in 2017. And as I say in the film, it's the dirty little secret is it's the best beat in journalism because yeah. You're taxed with taking someone, your subject, literally from the cradle to the grave, and that gives mm. you a built-in narrative arc. So mm. it is the most pure storytelling form in mm. any section of the newspaper. And yeah, indeed, sure. it lets you do the kind of book that I like to do because the whole structure of a book is there in microcosm. And you know, you take a thousand-word news feature, mm-hmm. you grit it, grit it up a hundred times, and presto, you have a book. Right. Yeah. So it, I'm sure that it taught you some of the skills of brevity and, uh, you know, sifting the details as well as grace and charity, but not at the expense of truth. Well, thank you. I, we always say um, and we have to remind families of this, you know, what we're reporting the news, the eulogies we leave to the ministers and the rabbis. So <laughs> indeed. So, uh, uh. so, yeah, I never in a million years, I'm a long form writer in my bones, never thought I'd wind up. 24 years on a daily paper, mm. but it indeed has proved the absolute best training for doing long form that mm. one could want. That's wow. really interesting. Well, we want to say yeah. thank you, Margo, uh, so much yeah, for this has been fantastic. coming on the program. You, you've, it's, we really, really enjoyed it. and um, We're going to work extra hard to find an excuse to have you back on. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I would like, you know, look, any writer, you know, the minute you say you can come and shill for your new book, they're, as, as the late great Spalding Gray would say, um, in, I guess it's swimming to Cambodia when he's in a movie and they say, will all the artists get on the plane? He says, we all went. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I'd be, it would be a shoehorn to get classical material into any of my later books, but if you can do it, more power to you. All so, right. Well, we'll do our best. Good. And thank you both very much. This was great thank fun. You. Okay. Pleasure to meet you. Take Love care. Take Likewise. Care. Keep Bye-bye. in touch. Bye-bye. Hey, that was great. Incredible. That was really wonderful. And I'm serious. We got to find an excuse to get uh, um, Ms. Fox back on. She can really tell a story. She can. That was great. And, uh, you know, for um, a book that she wrote and researched 10 years ago, yes. you know, for all of her claims of that being ancient history, for right. her, but she seemed to have almost like uh, immediate recall of every detail. She's <laughs> talking about Alice Cober's um, steel trap memory. Yeah. I think she's a competitor. I, I was thinking the same thing. It was incredible. Was, it was incredible. Right. But we, hey, we're up against it. We, we got to get out of here. Yep. Um, before we do that, Dave, tell us a little bit about um, the Moss Method and LLPS. I'd love to do that. So the Moss Method for Greek is a way that you, listener, can go from neophyte to erudite. That's correct. This program I've put together, it's divided into four modules, 40 lessons per module. I mean, it's comprehensive, right? Mm -hmm. One of the the things people typically say about my teaching in whatever setting is it's thorough, which sometimes I think they mean boring, (laughs) pedantic. (laughs) But no, it's it's thorough. If you really want to learn Greek, right, this is the way to do it. I I have no qualms about saying that. So go to mossmethod.com. Check out some of the hundreds of free Greek lessons, the thousands of free Latin lessons. See if this program is for you. And I also have a Latin program. Oh, tell us about that. That's the LPSI program. That's correct. Right? Yes. Go to latinperdm.com and you can study Latin with me. Uh, it's another self-paced, expert, and accessible way of going ab initio from the ground up with the Latin language. As I like to say, there may be better programs. I don't know. But I think the combination of expertise and cost makes for an incredible value. So now, I know that uh, I haven't said it in a while, but I yes. know that in both the Moth Method, Moth Method the Moss Method right. and LPSI, uh, the students have direct access to you. You're not farming this out to any no, flunkies. There's no flunky yep, involved. You've gotten you've not gone that route. Just this morning from ten AM to eleven AM Eastern time we yeah. had our Moss Method Zoom class. Nice. Where we had two students from California and one student from Switzerland. Wow. And we read some Greek together. Now it's open to anyone who's in the class, which presently is, you know, a 
large number of individuals, yeah. but to come and go like an office hour, right. show up, get your questions answered, practice a little Greek and go on your but way. How cool to also meet people from all over the world. It's fantastic. Right? That's it is really, really, really gratifying. That's awesome. So latinperdm.com, mossmethod.com. Check it out. Check it out. All right. Hey, we got to give our, our, our usual thanks here. Uh, thanks to Mishka, the, the, the wonder engineer. Yes. Uh, for uh, putting this all together. She'll have some challenges with this one, yeah. but I'm, I'm sure she can do it. She can do it. And and who else we got to thank? Scott Van Zen, the blistering guitar hero. Yes. Uh, who plays our intro and outro music. And Ken Tamplin, who uh, also composed and arranged that music, is a great musician himself, provides the bumper music that people are going to miss in yeah. this one. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. So yes. Thank Thank you, gentlemen, for your generosity. Yeah. And hey, if you want to get in touch, you got a question, you got a, a suggestion, a comment, you want to shout out, uh, don't hesitate to to uh, to get in touch. You can write to Dave, Dave at adnauseum.com. Don't forget the V. Or Jeff at adnauseum.com. Do not forget the V. Jeff, what are we doing next week? I don't think, do we know? No, it's another TBD. It's another TBD. Right. right. So now we're free, you might say, from uh, Virgil. Yes. I hate to put it that way. <laughs> yeah. But the world's our oyster. Right. No, so there's a bit of kind of a, a bit of postpartum after Virgil. Yeah, like it, it, I think it, that's it was true. like almost a full year yes. of episodes. Where but, did we go next? Right. But there's there's so many different directions we can go. We just need to settle upon right. um, uh, one for next week. Well, and people are going to love this one with yes. Margot Fox. I, yep. I think there's no doubt. This is great. And Dave, you have our gustatory parting shot. Yes. Now, typically, the gustatory parting shots, they are in the lighter vein, mm-hmm. somewhere between silly and ridiculous. They're yes. humorous. This one, no. This one's a little more um, reserved. This is. This is a little heavy. Well, I wouldn't say heavy. No, okay, maybe not Reserved. Heavy. It is reserved. Okay. okay. Yes. Uh, it's by one Elizabeth Gaskell. Now, in her work, Cranford, I, I don't know anything about this person, but I like this quote. Many a one has been comforted in their sorrow by seeing a good dish come upon the table. Can't disagree. Can you relate? I can. I can totally relate. Can Sit a- down with a load of cares and someone puts before you a nice juicy hamburger with a big side of fries. Game changer. Right it there. is. Yeah, that's Things right. lighten up a little, don't they? That's right. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Thank you.